So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our interviewer for tonight. He's a co-founder and a fellow board member of Mentorship Works. He's a uh, serial entrepreneur. She's telling you to get up and walk around. And actually a mentor of mine. Here we have him, Sean Havra. Thanks, Chris. A round of applause for our presidents, Chris Erickson. And uh, Mike, whatever you do, please don't hire Chris away. <laughs> He's a really valuable asset to our company. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Jacques Habra. I have the pleasure of leading this interview and uh, kind of getting more insights on mentorship, entrepreneurship, how to balance all that with a family life. Uh, Mike's wife is here in the audience tonight. And I want to tell you a little bit about Mike and then we're going to jump right into it. Now, a couple of important key announcements. We will be taking all of your questions and you can ask the questions in three ways. Towards the end of the program, we'll do it through the audience, through the microphone. But actually, I will be monitoring my phone for tweets and for emails on the fly. So all you have to do is send your tweet and make sure you include at Mentorship Works. That's our Twitter account, Mentorship Works. So just the at symbol for those of you that tweet. And then if you want to email us, simply email us at mentorshipworks at gmail.com. And I'd really like everybody to participate in questions. If you have anything you want to ask and you know, it's segues, whatever it might be. So Mike, thanks for being here. You're welcome. A little bit of background on Mike. Mike You're attended, welcome. sure. <laughs> Mike attended MIT on the East Coast. We're gonna talk about the East Coast. Because my, my first question is, did the New England Patriots deflate the footballs? Oh, um, based on Belichick's history, I'm tempted to say yes, but I think he doesn't care about the balls. I, don't, I think, I think I, I'd give him innocent on this one. Deflate gate. Deflate gate. I hope, that, uh, I hope it doesn't affect the Super Bowl. That's the key. But Mike actually is the CEO of Curvature, which you're going to hear a lot about, formerly known as Network Hardware Resale. He became the CEO in 2006, and he had joined originally in 2001. Mike has a very interesting background. What makes Mike's background so fascinating is its tremendous contrast. Usually when you meet somebody who has a background in finance, uh, you wouldn't expect them to also have an interest in philosophy and game theory. And then when you see that he has a lot of task-oriented capability, uh, he also mixes into that a lot of people-oriented capability. So a lot of contrast, a lot of spanning a lot of different skill sets, which we'll hear about. Curvature is on a real, uh, I guess what's the best word? I mean, it's growing like crazy. Uh, posted record revenues last year, 300 million in revenues. And this is, this is a, a pretty significant thing to achieve in a small beach town like Santa Barbara. There aren't too many companies that have even come close to this mark probably can count them on one or two hands. And uh, Mike really does cultivate mentorship in his culture. He cultivates entrepreneurship, and somehow he does so and still gets people to stick around and stay very loyal, like our board member here, John Osley, who works for Mike at Curvature. So please join me in welcoming Mike and thanking him for joining us and giving us his, his time tonight. So Mike, so you went to MIT and you studied game theory and philosophy. How does a guy study that and end up running a hardware company? Well, physics was too hard. <laughs> so um, when, you, when you like physics, you like to ask questions, and philosophy was kind of the easier version of that. But what I, what, at MIT, at least, the, the logic and game theory department was housed within philosophy. So that's where the philosophy came from. Really? Um, I spent most of my college career playing cards. So um, game theory came out of an interest in being a better bridge and blackjack player. Um, and they allowed you to major in it, which was cool. Um, um, wow. The, the, more interesting, the more interesting question was how you segue from basically being a good bridge player and an OK blackjack player to, and with a philosophy degree, actually needing a job. And that's actually where mentorship came in. I, my bridge partner in college got a job for a small derivatives trading company in Chicago. 
And basically, when I was looking around for something to do my senior year, she said, well, just interview with us. Just go to this hotel, the Hyatt on, if you've ever been to Cambridge, the Hyatt on the road there on the river. And this guy, Nick, will be there. And uh, just come and talk to him. So I walked in, and here's this guy with spectacles. I think Nancy knows Nick. Nick Nosarino. So Nick's sitting behind the desk. He's a bespectacled 30-year-old kind of intense analytical guy. And he goes, and you're 21. And I'm 21. Yeah. And he says, all right, sit down. All right, sit down. I'm in like jeans and a tie-dye shirt or something. Because <laughs> um, again, it was like, I, and, and, he, and he doesn't look up. And he, he goes, if you had a stack of pennies as tall as the World Trade Center, would it fit in this room? And he sort of went, and I was kind of like, uh, well, and you know, if you hundred stories, ten feet of story, pennies are small. Yeah, it'd fit kind of in the corner of the room. W would it really? Uh, there were one or two more questions, but basically it was like, all right, you're hired. Wow, that was it. So I got that was good. Game yeah. theory stood me well. And you ended that up. Regard. That's what led you to Chicago. Yep. Yeah. So I uh, hopped on a plane, moved to Chicago, and started trading on the floor in a little yellow coat. Going. <laughs> yeah, that was me. So we, we t you talked about uh, Bridge and Blackjack for a minute. Mm -hmm. How many people here, by a show of hands, have seen the film 21? Okay. What if I told you that Mike was maybe indirectly, maybe indirectly involved in <laughs> consulting or? Indirectly. Yeah, indirectly kind of. No, I played a, Bridge with the guys that were the basis for that movie, but I didn't go to Vegas. Well, it, it's a they were really good Bridge players, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It, it, again, goes to that amazing mix when you've got the, the quantitative, you know, the math, mathematics, the, the, the real science, and then at the same time you have the, the chutzpah to just get out there and, and actually pull it off to behave, to act and, and accomplish that. Well, you know, the, the best part about the job was it was being on the exchange floor and trading derivatives was a lot like playing games for a living. And that's, um, I'm going to jump ahead because I know one of the questions you were going to ask me is about lessons you learned. And the, the best part about a, a background in trading is it teaches you that you've got to take risks. Because if you don't take risks, you never make any money. And that you lose all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you lose 55, you know, 45, 40% 40 of the time you lose. And if you're lucky, 55 or 60% of the time you win. And then in the end, you end up making a bunch of money. And that's a, I think that's an enormously valuable perspective when you think about business. Certainly in our business, um, we've made two or three really successful moves. And I, I know I'm jumping around here a little bit. But we've made like 11 that, for every three, we made 11 that didn't work. It was just that you cut your losses quickly and then you throw money at the stuff that works. And that's, um, the, the people that work for me, that's probably the hardest thing I drill into them, is if you never take any chances, nothing good ever happens. So it was a, a great background. And there were, some, uh, there were some real obvious parallels to the hardware business that we're in as well, which I'm sure we'll talk, talk about. But that, that um, attitude towards taking a risk and when you lose being like, well, I mean, so let's you know, step back up to the free throw line and shoot it again. Right. Um, you know, because unlike basketball, you don't have to make 9 out of 10. You've got to make 55 out of 100. Yeah. Um, most people that miss 10 in a row never step back up. That's yeah, Mike, Michael Jordan has a great quote about that. He says that, uh, you know, he, he comes out, he says, I've missed, uh, you know, 67 shots that would have allowed my team to win. I've mm -hmm. missed 2,000, you know, free shots that I should have made. And, and the failure, the missed shots is why I'm so successful. Yeah, he's the all-time leader in missed shots, yeah. <laughs> he is. The all-time record. That will probably never be equaled. <laughs> Yeah, and probably maybe his greatness will never be equal too. That's my son loves basketball, which is why I know that, by the way. But yeah, Michael Jordan never, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar never missed nearly as many shots as Michael Jordan. Made more, but missed far fewer. Yeah. So the, this first mentor you mentioned, who mm -hmm. who told you to go and try this interview out when you were wearing the tie-dye mm -hmm. shirt, they um, tell us about that. How did you meet mm -hmm. this person? Who were they? And and. And give us an honest reason. Why did they take an interest in you? I mean, what was, was there something different you were doing? Was it the, you know, were they just a gracious person? Did they just like you? What was the issue? Well, I, I mean, I think she was the girlfriend of a guy in my fraternity, so it wasn't magic how I found her. But she loved to play cards. And there were not that many. There, everybody plays cards in college, and very few people are any good. This is why cards are so good to play in college mm -hmm. if you're good. 
Um, doesn't, euchre, spades, doesn't matter. You can just clean up. Anyway, everybody loves to play cards. Very few people are good. So we played a lot of cards, poker and euchre. And, and it didn't take long for me to recognize that she was an absolute shark. And I was pretty good, too. So she said, come play bridge. I'd never played bridge before and sort of taught me. And I started with another guy and eventually started pairing up with her. Little did I know that she was the Canadian junior national champion. So she wow. was like, she was quite a good masters bridge player and kind of pulled me along and we won a bunch of tournaments. Um, and it was that relationship as we got to know each other. Bridge, if you don't know bridge very well, it's a, it's a game, but it's a game that it's very, you, you got to know each other very well. So you get to know how you communicate um, and you do take a lot of chances and you have to interpret things. Um, so she knew me very well, I knew her. She was a year ahead of me. She left, again, went to work in Chicago, and, and that fateful call came one night and said, just show up. Just please go to the interview. It's like playing bridge for a living. And that was, I was like, cool. And so she, she was, was she working for the same company? Or was mm -hmm. she on the, on the trading board as well? Yep. She had moved, she had, was just moving to Europe when I joined, and I ended up moving to Europe and working for her in Europe. So that was, I mean, you talk about mentorship. Uh, her name is Bronya. I... She never worked with me originally, but as soon as I sort of made it out of the pit, you sort of, Swiss Bank at the time, Swiss Bank bought this little company and would hire 12 and keep two. So nobody really cared about you until you emerged from the 12. Um, it was too hard to predict whether you'd be successful. So you just hired a bunch and threw them at the wall and the ones that stuck mm -hmm. moved on. Kind of like um, the, the formula of risk and... Yeah, I think it applies to people too, I guess, right? Um, Interviewing, those of you that have big companies or interview a lot of people know this, there is nothing more complicated than interviewing a person. It is, to this day, the startup that I would love to invest in is the startup that can somehow match what I need with what people are because it's still very hard. There's no... I can help you with that. Okay. works is uh, looking for new sponsors. Yeah, because we... Uh, I think we, we hired 170 but let 100 go or something last year. So it's, it's hard. Um, it's hard to figure it out. But uh, well, so anyway, so, so she, once I sort of emerged, she started keeping track of me. It's like, how's it going? What are you doing? And I sort of w would kept bouncing ideas off of her. And eventually, she pulled me along and pulled me up for about three or four years. Yeah, pulled me up. You, you mentioned mm -hmm. that when we talked mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. That, that's an interesting concept. I mean, that's something that you guys instill at Curvature, mm -hmm. the idea of, of basically taking an interest in somebody who's a junior level and guiding them and pulling them up. Mm -hmm. Speak to that a little. Well, it, it, you know, part of it's, a, part of it's a, a necessity at Santa Barbara. There's just hardly the community you have in the Bay Area or New York. I mean, you interview for a, I mean, I, I, one of the positions we were looking for recently was a, um, uh, an SEO pay-per-click guru, and there's like 10 in there. Did you meet Chris Erickson earlier? Hmm? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to hire him. I'll talk to him about that. Yeah. I was there. He's the one I'm not supposed to hire, though. Well, you can, you can hire him as an independent contractor. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, there's like 10. So okay. it's much easier and much uh, more valuable, certainly for a company, to hire someone who's, who wants that, who wants to learn that skill, who might have the basics, and bring them along. And mm -hmm. we have found in at almost every level in our company from my COO who started as my assistant who now runs 250 people worldwide um, seven years later to any number of other positions come in and you you really allow them to rise as fast and as far as as they're willing to go and it and that's usually easy to see because mm -hmm. you give them the next task and when they fail you've kind of found their limit but uh, we tend to we try to match good people up very closely with more senior people and they just they ride their coattails right and it, it's interesting I'm, I'm teaching a course where I've got some students here in the audience at City College in marketing and online marketing and I tell them you know we, we're not going to use any books because the minute you print this book in this particular medium it's outdated mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that can be said for building a startup these days it's changing so much mm -hmm. it seems like you have to have that to, to be effective to be successful it's hard to get all of your knowledge from academia and from books. You have to have someone kind of looking out. Well, the, yeah, I think that the technology and, and the economy both are moving at, a, at an ever-increasing pace. At least it feels like that when the products we sell, the, the companies we work with, 
are running faster and harder to do, you know, what the, the types of leaps that are being made are so much more substantial now, right? It used to be Ethernet became fast Ethernet, and fast Ethernet became gigabit Ethernet. And, and those were big changes, but they were the same. It was just a faster car, right? So you, you change it out. And now people are dealing with, you know, security used to be keep your passwords safe. Now there are 12 different types of security devices that do intrusion detection and uh, packet inspection within the network. And they, there are companies now that are harnessing 10 billion bad guys keeping a database and in real time trying to use that database and inspect packets in real time. 10 billion records in a couple of milliseconds, right? I mean, it's never been done before. Well, didn't it, even five years ago, it was keep your password safe. Now it's yeah. 12 different dimensions. So um, I think it's the world becoming increasingly hard and as a startup, trying to figure out, I mean, again, in, especially in technology, trying to figure out just where, you know, where you even have a defensible, you know, advantage. It used to be that was the whole business school, right? You need to be 18 months ahead of the nearest competitor. And I mean, I'm not sure you need to be 18 months anymore. I just don't know that you know, you might be 18 months behind and think you're ahead. Okay. Because it's just moving so fast. Yeah. And just, just as a aside, does everybody here by show of hands know exactly what curvature does? Okay, only a few of you. And this is fascinating. I, I never, I, when, I, when I first heard about curvature, it was eight years ago when I moved to Santa Barbara. And somebody told me they were selling for curvature for network hardware resale. And I thought, wait a minute, so you're telling me that you've got these Cisco routers, and, and routers are basically the, the little appliance, the little device that handles all of the data, all of the packets that the internet is handling. Big device. Big device, yeah. But then, they're littler now, they're little, but they used to be really big. Huge. So, and, and, and what these guys do is they basically take the old ones, they refurbish them, and then they resell them. Now, how are you going to build a business to that? Now you're up to 300 million. So, well, you know, I think you could ask the same of CarMax, right? They take old cars. But the, the idea was, uh, we, we looked for a long time. The, the business was really good. Cisco makes very expensive, multi-hundred thousand dollar, gigantic refrigerator sized appliances. And what was 200,000 became 50,000, but we could pay 20 and sell it for 50. Great business. Really a, a pretty brick and mortar business, except that making sure it works and warrantying it and, and was fairly technical. So there was this deep technical side, but the selling of it was pretty easy. It was everybody uses it. You had the dot com boom, bust, boom again, bust again, now boom again. Um, but at every stage, the internet and the infrastructure that powers it was expanding. So we were fortunate to be in a space that, that the cycle was very muted as, as the demand for this product was almost unlimited through, through most of the last 15 years. Um, we've, the business has evolved a lot from that beginning, but that's still about 75% of what we do is buy one to 10 year old networking equipment, refurbish it, resell it, warranty it, and now maintain it, monitor it, manage it, and some yeah. other things. Yeah. And so what year was Curvature founded? Uh, Network Hardware Resale was founded around 94. 94. And at that time, what were you doing? I was, in 94, I was in London trading exotic options for Swiss Bank Corporation. <laughs> okay, so you went from Chicago to London. I went from Chicago to London to New York to London to Switzerland to New York. Okay. And then was it at that time that, oh, by the way, you know, uh, Curvature was founded by your father or your brother? Or both? Both. Yeah. And at that time, they were like, you know, we're, we, we need some help. And well, they think? were, I mean, the business started as a real brokerage operation. So, um, and this, you know, mentorship is interesting. It sort of goes both ways. My father had asked me to be on the board. Again, it's a $5 million private little company. But the parallels between trading whether it's exotic options, credit derivatives, emerging market debt, all the things that I did over the course of 10 years, the parallels between trading uh, sophisticated financial products and illiquid, depreciating, weird routers and switches were actually quite remarkably close. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe hard to segue, but these, you know, the, the best part about emerging markets and exotic options were no one knows what the price should be, there was very little transparency, they're very complicated, so if you, if, you, if you think you knew what the risks were and how to price them, you could make a lot of money because people didn't. So we, 
I mean, just to give you an example, we used to trade this thing called a, uh, well, it was, so if, if a currency was trading at one, we would say you can sell it for 1.1, but if it hits 0.9, you, did, you never sold it in the first place. And mm -hmm. people thought this was the greatest thing. It was like, I, I'm making 10% of my money right from the beginning. It's free money. We made like 200 basis points on every one of these trades for two years, which if you're in the financial markets, put that on 200 million. We were making $4 million a trade for something that was a joke. It was easy. You could hedge it right away. No one knew what it was, and it looked too good to be true, and of course it was too good to be true. But um, <laughs> um, I didn't blow up Orange County. I only almost did. So are you um, saying that, that in that early stage, the, the business was a lot like what happens in, on the Chicago Board of Trade? Yeah, the, the business in Wall Street is often no different than what happens in a startup. You're making stuff up, and you're coming up with new ideas, and um, you know, um, structured products nowadays. You have all these notes that do weird things. Please don't buy them. <laughs> um, but those things, I mean, again, most structured products are just little whiz kids that are 28 like I was, putting stuff together and using money from one source to pay for derivatives on another and throw it in a note and you got a structured product. Um, and the margins are just massive. Um, what was the point of all this? The, the, parallels, <laughs> the parallels between um, strange financial products and um, illiquid, uh, complex, um, products with no transparency on the harbor side were actually almost identical. So being on the board for a couple of years, it became obvious that there was a risk management and a, and a perspective that I thought I could bring and I think they thought I could bring um, to this business. And as the business went from 5 million to 10 million to almost 20 million, you know, they, they I think felt like the brokerage side of the business, just taking very little risk, matching up buyers and sellers the way you would in a brokerage was, was beginning to lose its ability to really grow. Mm -hmm. And the, the next stage of evolution was to take risk and begin to, with, with much more risk taken, more inventory, market these products to actual companies. All right, so actually own, keep the inventory. Keep the inventory for 60, route. 90, 180 days. Mm -hmm. And go to banks and ISPs and technology firms and try to get them to buy it. I mean, there's brokerage, is, the difference between brokerage and retail is, you know, I guess can't be overstated. If you're brokering to someone who owns the client, you're making thin margins, but it's easy. If you're trying to own the client, you know, you're responsible for the quality, you're responsible for the warranty, you're responsible for the marketing, you're for all of that, which you don't have to do as a broker. Mm -hmm. You also need actual salespeople, right? Not brokers, well, we used to do fax blasts. This is a little different than the internet, but as soon as the internet came along, advertising in the brokerage world was just join a bulletin board, post it, and it's like pre-eBay. It was easy. If you wanted to sell to AT&T, you had to get on the phone with AT&T. You met them at a trade show, and you wined and dined them, and then you got on the phone, and you had seven meetings. And yeah, finally, they bought a quarter million dollars worth of memory, which is the biggest deal we'd ever done. Nancy did that deal, by the way. Hi, Nancy. Um, but, you know, but it was work. It was hard work. It took months. and. Um, so the business, when I joined, the big fundamental shift, one of the big fundamental shifts we made was we went from 500,000 in inventory to 4 million in a year and went from 20 million in revenue to 46 in a year. So, I mean, it, wow. it, it worked, but it was hard. I mean, it yeah. was. Yeah, well, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. It's impressive. And it's a good segue to a question from the audience. Uh, Dave Newton wants to know, as Curvature is at 500 employees and offices in Santa Barbara, Singapore, Amsterdam, is it possible to not only maintain a consistent internal firm culture and ethos, but also introduce and develop a new thinking to stay current as the external environment changes? Is that good, Dave? Yeah. Um, the former is easier than the latter. Um, we do, we try very hard to encourage our talented young people to hop on a plane and move overseas. So we have people, particularly from the home office where the culture is strongest, we have our, our GM in Europe and Asia are both from this office. Uh, we have a number of salespeople that have moved to various places. Um, and then and vice versa, in, in technical positions, we often bring them back and they'll work here for a year. So we try very hard um, to do that, to, to move the culture forward and stay current. We've shifted from a hardware business now to really a service-focused business. That's been much more brutal than getting Amsterdam to think 
like the US, which actually wasn't that hard. There are you know, money-motivated, trading-oriented people, even in the most socialist of places, as it turns out. Um, getting that unified culture to become more service, long-term sales-oriented from a brokerage, short-term sale, that's hard. So I think it's yes and no. But, and we're trying hard. So st startups are, are pretty much the, the buzzword right now. Mm -hmm. Kids are developing them at young ages in high school, and uh, everybody wants to, to can, build a startup. You can blame WhatsApp. WhatsApp, yeah. Or Tinder, <laughs> or, I don't know, Snapchat. And you name it. A good, friend of mine had a, a good friend of mine had a really, really brilliant programmer at build.com, which sells plumbing supplies, toilets, basically, on the internet. $600 million company. His, basically, head of development went to work for WhatsApp and got 2.1% of the company nine months before the purchase. 2.1% oh. of $18 billion. 19. And he was 27. That's why startups. That's and, why startups are the buzzword. And guys. WhatsApp, maybe tell the crowd what, what they do. What the app WhatsApp does. is instant message. I mean, it's, I, I, it's instant message that was worth 19 billion to Facebook, and it was I think 40 people. Anyone know the 38, 40 guys? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the the least rich guy at WhatsApp has 100 million. Yeah. We need a few of these uh, victories in Santa Barbara. Yeah. We do? What's our best IPO victory so far? Well, not IPO, but we have lynda.com, which is just doing absolutely fabulous. You know they've been working on their valuation. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Official reports are that they are now valued at approximately $1 billion. Yeah, for sure. After 20 years, they're an overnight success. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, and you got, Thanks, you, got, yeah, you got Sonos and others, too. We got Sonos is companies. a really yeah. cool story, too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are definitely some on their way out. I'm thinking about a company, though, and, and, and this is what I'm hoping, and organizations like Mentorship Works and, mm -hmm. and events like this will cultivate is, you know, a, a company that can socially, in a conscious way, develop a product or service, hit a home run, and overnight, you've got 100 millionaires that keep doing good things in the community, keep giving back. Keep trying to, to make this, uh, you know, keep the, keep the environment the way it is. Hopefully buying houses. Hopefully buying yeah. houses, yeah, for everyone. So, yeah, I, we haven't had yet that in Santa Barbara in terms of an of a overnight success that has caused 100 people to do that. You, had it, you had it in the late 90s. We did? You had software.com and a few other companies, but it's Before been, my time. It's been I, since then. Yeah, we also have uh, Peter Schlur's company. I forgot what, it, what the name of it is, but he does a virtual reality. And he built the virtual reality lab that Oculus showed off in, and they Oculus got bought for a billion or something, didn't they? Wasn't that, mm -hmm. it was By a very, very high Google, number. right? Mm -hmm. So we have Peter Schlur's company in town, and that they are uh, just a matter of time in the next one month to four years. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good time to be here. There's a there's there's a few startups here tonight. And I'd love to put them on the spot. Um, Dan, are you here? Yeah, come on up. Dan has a startup uh, that came out of City College, actually. And uh, I thought it might be kind of fun to have uh, Dan give us his one minute uh, elevator pitch on why his startup is amazing. And then, Mike, you could give him some feedback. All right. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Everybody hear me? Hey everybody, my name is Dan Friedman. I'm uh, one of the two founders of Fuelbox. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about us before. Oh, but uh, we started at the Santa Barbara City College, the Entrepreneurship Center. Um, my partner and I, Robert Herr, we came up with an idea because of a simple problem we were having. Uh, we kept losing our phone chargers, which I think some of you may have gone through before. And so we thought, why not just build one into the wall? Simple idea, correct? So overnight, we built a prototype built a universal cord into the wall that would pull out when you needed it, and when you wouldn't, it would snap back into the wall. Then we realized, why be tied to the outlet? Why not bring the outlet to you? So that's where the whole system of the mobile battery just came into play. So our first product is a universal phone charger that is built into the wall, has all the cords you need, but also has a mobile battery that pops off 
so you can take it with you when you're running out the door or when you're just too lazy and you want to sit on the couch and charge your phone. So, so far we, uh, we've been raising money, we've seated ourselves with uh, about $200,000, uh, had a very successful Indiegogo pre-order campaign, did about 1,500 products, and we've been getting crazy amounts of interest from retailers across the US. Uh, we have about five retailers right now that have already asked for our first inventory, which we're currently building. So um, basically, that's kind of our story, is that we are bringing this great product to market, and my question for you, Mike, is uh, we've been receiving amazing amounts of interest. We already have pre-orders, mm -hmm. we've been seated, but we're having a problem raising money to build our first inventory and to create working capital to get products out the door and really start scaling. So I kind of wanted to ask you, what is your opinion on, obviously, a hardware company that needs has a lot of pre-production costs, has a mm -hmm. lot of inventory costs, which is obviously more difficult than a software company. What would you advise us on both, you know, a bridge financing option as well as, um, you know, raising equity to build our inventory, get the product to market, and continue building our future products because we're a brand here, not just a simple product. Yeah. Round of applause for Dan. Um, oh, that's about I have about five questions in one. Um, I guess the the first the first you know questions I guess I'd want to hear you answer is how the product differentiates itself from the the other cool. I mean, there are pads now you just set your phone on and it charges, and so the you know how does the universal plug and the fact that you can take it away. How does that compare to the other leading products? I mean, if you if you pull the thing out of the wall, aren't you going to lose that? And then you've lost the same thing as losing your plug. So these are, I assume you have a good answer to that. If you can answer that, if you've got orders, financing, inventory, um, you're going to get a lot of people that'll say, "Give me, you know, I'll give you the money and give me 10% of your company, and and you'll be you'll be all set." I would avoid those like the plague. I think with with orders in hand, you should be able to trade finance. Even at exorbitant interest rates, you can get Silicon Valley Bank to give you a million bucks at 18%. Get those first orders out of the door. Just keep the equity. That would be my guess. And I think there's plenty of people. You might find people willing to give you money with a small amount of warrants that you know turn into equity if things, but at a much higher valuation. You should you should be able to get that kind of money and not knowing how much you need. If it's 20 million, that's different. But to to build 10,000, what are they? Fifty dollar widgets. $25 widgets, you should be able to get the financing without giving away a big chunk of equity. Yeah, they cost 25 to build. They're about 100 to 120 retail. Mm -hmm. And how many pre-orders do you have? Uh, we have about 1,500 pre-orders through our Indiegogo campaign. And uh, we have about 1,500 through our Indiegogo campaign. And we have a order for 1,000 units from a retailer in uh, the Bay Area. And then we have a retailer that wants 5,000 units to start right off the bat. So we're looking for 1.5 million total to really uh, for our Series A, you'd say. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. It's fascinating. All right. Um, a lot of people would say that joining a family business is the worst thing you should do. Some people say it's awesome. What was it like uh, working with your dad and with your brother? It was the, the best of times and the worst of times. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said that famously. Um, uh, no, it was a little bit of both. It yeah. was absolutely a little bit of both. It was um, maddening when um, you were, when you're arguing with someone that you've grown up with, it's not all about rational argument, right? It becomes all weird and, yeah. um, and it did. I mean, I, I I was very quickly advocating, a, from their perspective at least, an incredibly risky strategy, right? Basically, let's mortgage our future on buying 10 times as much stuff as we've ever right. bought, hiring, getting, changing the job, essentially, of the 12 salesmen we had, and in the process, lost a few. I mean, it was a, it was a tumult. Now, ultimately, we did it, and it worked, but it would have been, um, I, would have, I would have been far better received by a simple Wall Street yeah. committee who sort of spoke that language? Family makes it hard. Uh, yeah, your your brother knew that. You know, he remembers when you took the family car when it was his night to yeah. have it. Yeah, uh, when when I <laughs> threw the thing out the window and landed on his brand new 240Z that he painted right. and scratched it. Yeah, um, uh, leaves a mark. Yeah, and then and then there, you know, 
the, being in a family, there's always, you know, who's in charge? Who's, what, where, where are you in the business relative to where are you in the family? And that's never easy. Um, the good news is you can trust them. Everybody's working for the same yeah. cause, moving in the same direction. So I'd say it has its pluses and minuses. So another question, and this came up actually in the, in the networking hour, why change the name? What was the thinking behind that? That's, a, that's an expensive, yeah. uh, major, major change. I mean, you had a lot of equity in NHR. Yeah, it was a controversial decision. Um, we had been network hardware resale since the mid-90s, and by 08 or 09, I mean, I guess I gotta take one step backwards. By 09, when the financial markets collapsed, um, Although our product was the less expensive alternative in a market with a pretty good tailwind, no one bought anything in the first quarter of 09. Like literally just markets stopped. So, uh, and, and we were not immune from that. Our first quarter of 09 was about 30% below the first quarter of 08. So not a disaster, but for a, a business with a fairly high fixed cost base, it was eye-opening. Um, what we realized was the, the warranty we had been providing on hardware for years, um, at this point was a one-year warranty, was a great add-on product to people that didn't buy the product from us but needed inexpensive warranty service. It's the same, every time you buy something at Best Buy, they want you to buy their warranty, um, which you shouldn't buy, by the way, but you should buy it from me. Um, <laughs> um, you shouldn't buy any, any, what about like when you get your $500 iPhone? Do you do well, the Apple the trick is the trick is that the, the ones the big box sellers sell are about 10 times the cost if you actually go to a third party. You can get a good iPhone plan for 30, 40 bucks. And I think it's 150 from, mm -hmm. from the retailer, right? Hey, so. Mike, I just want to let you know we buy them every time. I don't buy them. <laughs> You've never told me. Oh. <laughs> My wife buys them. There's a philosophical uh, <laughs> yeah. issue um, here. So, um, <laughs> so we, we started to move the business in a more service direction because we were, we were a $200 million company at the time in a $40 billion market with a $400, million, $400 billion install base. So you, you so had a really tiny percentage of the market. Tiny, tiny, tiny. We're still tiny. It's a huge market. So our thought was if there's $400 billion of this stuff installed, much of which is past the manufacturer's willingness to warranty it, why don't we come in and say, well, warranty it for you. We only need, you know, one-tenth of one percent of that market to have a big booming business. So that happened and it's been working. Our, our warranty business has been growing very rapidly. And by last year, network hardware resale, we had also expanded from networking equipment into servers and storage. We had also expanded from resale into new partnerships with companies like Arista and some of the leading edge companies. We were doing maintenance and professional services, so we weren't a networking company, we weren't a hardware company, and we weren't a resale company anymore. So the name actually sent, especially new customers, a message that, that gave them an inaccurate, it wasn't just different, it was a completely inaccurate perception of what we did. So it, it, was, it was time. So it was time. It was time. But it was a few million dollars and a lot of work later to do it. It's not an inexpensive oh, yeah. process. Imagine. This is, we, we hired a firm. Imagine that virtually every one, two, three, and four letter acronym dot com is taken. Every single one. All of them. Yeah, I was going to say, Just, was, was curvature.com? Curvature.com, we, we had to buy from someone, but it was for sale. Okay. It was, it was, there actually, Six figures, it had a sales. Five yeah, figures? It was, yeah, it was expensive enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we looked at, I don't know, 3,000 names and got four. Four worked. Yeah. Because after you can actually buy the URL, then you need to trademark it, not just here, but in Tokyo and London and you know, 60 countries, there were four. Yeah. And, and three of them were really stupid. <laughs> so curvature yeah. was it. Yeah, and then if, you can always do what, what Google did and just basically invent a word. Yeah, no, and that's, I think the, the, the most famous of that is Accenture, right? Which mm -hmm. accent on the future, they, they've come up with a really good ex explanation for how they came up with that word. Um, but that's the easiest way to do it now. You come up with a word that means nothing, Zizzywig or something, right? And right. Then, and then you can trademark it and buy it, and it's all cheap and free. But if you actually want it to say something, it can be remarkably expensive. Remarkably. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Griffin Bonek wants to know why no one plays bridge anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't play bridge anymore. I don't know why is that. It's such a great game. All the people die. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, his, his his other question 
is what were your top hurdles to becoming a, a successful entrepreneur? Oh, um, top hurdles. I mean, not in like middle ground, like things that are really personal and um, painful. Well, the, the <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think this gets back to when my father and brother, who both decided to retire in 2005, um, my father gave me some very good advice, and he, he said, it's all about the people. And I think as a startup in particular, you'd never figure that out until often too late, is in a big, as, a, as an individual contributor or as a startup, it's often you. Right? And all you need are people to check the box, but you're the driving force. You're the, the Steve Jobs. You're the one making all the decisions. Um, and to some extent in the operation of our company, that was true for me. I could, I could handle all the inventory and all the pricing and all the buying and all the policies and all the, and I could basically run that myself. And then when you, when you take over a CEO of a 200 and some person, 200 person company at the time, and it begins to grow, um, it's all about the people. And that was probably the hardest thing for me to learn. I went through, um, what, there's, not, there's, not a, there's not an executive on my staff that was an executive then. And that's not all their fault. A lot of it's their fault. Some of them weren't very good. But some of it was my fault. Because I couldn't figure out how to wrestle them in to do things the way I needed them done. And, yeah. and also allow them to do things the way they were good at doing them. That was a hard lesson. I mean, and I said personnel, personnel are, are hard. Um, are and, your um, strategic advisors smarter than you? Uh, no. <laughs> they're very smart, but they're different. And that's, I think, more than anything, I mean, I think entrepreneurship is interesting. I think the, the paradigm is, is the, the brilliant guy in his garage with the, the soldering gun, right? And that's often true. And I think for that person, the biggest impediment, and I think for the, for the WhatsApps of the world, that's, that's typically true. You have a very smart person with a great idea. You're never going to find anyone smarter than you because you know you're the smartest. And I'm saying that to everyone in the room who's a brilliant entrepreneur. You know you're the smartest guy in the room. So what you really need to do is appreciate people that, that have different knowledge. And I think if you can acknowledge that, um, and that's easy with things like legal, right? You, contracts, just, just give it to somebody who's good. But there's, you know, especially in today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine the, I forget your name, the hardware startup. Dan. Dan. Um, you know, Dan's eventually going to need somebody who's really good on the web and, and, and there's expertise there and they know it. And he's going to need a really good financial advisor when the sharks come circling to, to lend him money and he gets the 770 page document to lend him 500 grand, right? And every, and it's in six point type. That's where you, you, you have to, you have to leverage other people's expertise. They may not be smarter than you, but they're good. And if you can trust in that, you'll go a long way. Cause I think that's the best thing my father said is even if they're 80% as good as you, if you have 10 of them, that's eight more of you, right? <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's good to, to, to internalize. Um, so a lot of, a lot of these uh, startup entrepreneurs are getting their ideas before they graduate. What are your thoughts on, on school, on university? Is, is it important to finish or is it okay to drop out and start? You know, I think I, think I would have said 20 years ago, you know, you should probably figure out a way to finish and maybe do the idea on the side. I think if you're a, if you're a technological entrepreneur um, in this day and age, ideas have a shelf life of about six months. So if you've really got a great idea, especially the way colleges work nowadays, it's easy enough to take two classes, not four, delve into it, and if it doesn't work, go back to taking four. So I think that, um, and again, it's, it's a little bit hard because I think you, you really are speaking to kind of the 1% that have the really good, brilliant, crazy idea. But if you've got that, um, the markets, especially today, are so ripe. I mean, we have private equity firms that call us, and our business is boring by comparison to a lot, but there's money being thrown at everything now that's, that's really hot. So mm -hmm. um, if you've got that game-changing idea, you've got to pursue it. So it's okay, to, it. it's okay to step away? Absolutely. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg and, and others. <laughs> what about what about later in life? What about continuing education? I mean, is it something that you encourage at Curvature? Do you guys oh, provide yeah. any sort of you know? Like I think that's credits? the exact opposite. I think if even if you're Mark Zuckerberg, 
if he's not spending a couple weeks at Harvard every year, he's an idiot, because there's so much to learn. Um, why, as an entrepreneur, you wouldn't want to learn about finance, marketing, human resource issues, leadership? And there's great continuing education classes, and we encourage it. We send most of our executives go to at least one class every year. And I know when I, when I first started with the company, I think I went to about 10 between Stanford, Harvard, Columbia. There's all these great programs out there now. Um, I think I went to about 10 classes over five years, and they were hugely valuable. So you got to keep learning. Yeah. Yeah. And go to TED and go to, I mean, there's so many great mentorship venues works. now. Mentorship works. Yeah. There are so many great venues to learn stuff that, uh, and the world's moving fast. So yeah. it's amazing. You can literally type anything into a Google search box and, and get some sort of answer. Mm -hmm. Are, are, they, there, are there any other entrepreneurs in the crowd that want to do a one minute pitch? See what, see what, uh, come on up. <laughs> well, it's got to be in your own words, so just, yeah, yeah. so just come on up and take the mic so everybody can yeah. hear you. sure it's a pitch so much as I heard you spoke to the idea of human capital, the mm -hmm. idea of finding the right people. Now, have you used any sort of um, psychological databases or anything mm -hmm. like that to find those people? And I'm still looking for a one minute pitch. <laughs> um, we have. We actually, um, despite my um, despite my suggestion that we are terrible at it, we use two or three different psychological profiles. We've profiled our top salespeople, bottom salespeople, little did they know why we were profiling them. Um, we've compared the scores in a very detailed analysis to all the applicants, um, and it, it does help, um, but it's taken us from a 20% success rate to a 30, and that's, you know, that's 50% better, but, um, you know, at a cost of, 10,000 an applicant, which isn't inexpensive either. So the happy middle ground, um, the, literally the person that can predict someone's success is going to make a lot of money if they can really do it in a given job. And I, I don't think it's easy because it has a lot to do with the, the personality of the organization you're putting them in as well, which is maybe the hardest to profile. It's not like you can just say, oh, this person's a brilliant programmer, take any job and they'll be successful. They're very different. Yeah. So. We have another pitch. Okay, good. Let's hear pitch. it. My name is Aaron Freeman, and I'm CTO and co-founder of Shiphawk. And we're a startup here in Santa Barbara that's doing great things and really having a lot of success. So uh, we raised a Series A round of $5 million several months ago, and now we're, we're starting to scale. So um, what do you do? <laughs> We, we're a technology company, but we, we provide shipping services, and we provide shipping services all the way from rating to booking to tracking to actual comprehensive service on the jobs as well. And um, mostly we integrate with shopping carts for online uh, e-commerce stores. We have a Magento plug-in now, so that's a big push for us right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can integrate with any um, anyone that needs shipping prices and then to actually book the shipping and and to uh, handle it in the bus way. You're not a transportation company though. You're not a no. competitor to DHL or FedEx or No, we, we leverage all those guys. So mm -hmm. we have uh, about sixty carriers that we work with mm -hmm. and uh, that's one of our main competitive mm -hmm. advantages over other services that might do what we do is we go to some of the alternative uh, shipping companies, especially for furniture, blanket wrap carriers. And we get their rates from them cool. and program them into our system. So we're hiring. Uh, we've got about 20 positions, I think, open on the website. Nice. Right now. Thanks, Aaron. So, Aaron, just one thought is I would get away from Magento and go to Shopify. Shopify, we could put it on the list for the next Cool. One. Yeah, just because we've had experience with that, and Magento seems to be problematic. Would you agree, Max? <laughs> with, with a lot of that. So, Shopify might be good, but. Mike, your thoughts? No, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that the online, there are, I mean, Transportation Insight, there are probably three dozen transport companies that do load balancing and inexpensive lane mapping for companies. Um, I'd be curious to see how you do that on an automated way for a shopping cart. I think it's just, 
fascinating idea, but it's a huge, huge market. And there are, if you've not found them yet, there are transportation and logistics focused investment banks. And I mean, there, there's a whole sub industry around that world. So you should try to, I mean, uh, trade shows and expos, and you should plug yourself into that world and you'll get, you'll find the companies that both you're, com you're competing with, which I think is important to know, and the ones giving money and investing. And the more profile you can get with them, I think the better you do. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron from Shiphawk. So, um, more questions from the audience. So we're getting a lot more tweets. Keep them coming. Uh, Matt, AKA Seva, would like to know, what role do you see gamification playing in the future of business, in the future of the world? And you've got the game theory background. Gamification. Gamification. I mean, this, this is starting to get big. Am I supposed to know what that is? <laughs> I think what Matt means I mean, is... I guess. I'm just wondering if Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, a term I don't... How many people remember. here have... Uh, uh, we just had Christmas. How many people have got a wearable? Something that they wear and they track themselves with. A Fitbit. Four people? Five people? Have a Fitbit. Well, th this is a form of gamification, right? You, you now are wearing something. It's tracking you. At the end of the day, it tells you how many steps you take. It, it gives you uh, goals. It gives you uh, objectives. That's a form of gamification. But what if, like, products and services were designed around that? Well, the, well I mean, I, speaking only from what I know well, the, the biggest thing happening in, in the world of Internet hardware is Chambers' Internet of Things, which is he wants every company, every retail store to know everything about you, everywhere you go, all the time. So every device, every... Every, every time you stop in front of a shop window, your phone would let the network know that you stopped in front of the window. The retailer would know what was in the window that you stopped in front of, and they would be able to stream ads to you based on the product you saw in the window. Okay. Right, so this is what's coming. There's no like privacy, privacy issues? Oh, no, none, of course not. No. <laughs> but this is what's coming. Shopping malls and online stores, you've already got the cookie thing. Yeah. You know, everybody, you can visit a website and for three days all you see is ads for those shoes that you looked at on, on Zappos for the next three days. That's, that's like child's play. Um, I think um, if, if gamification is the right word, the idea that everything will be interconnected and tracked and looked at and data mined, um, there are more startups in data mining and big data around than any other field in Silicon Valley right now. There are hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And the one they can figure out that protocol, how to turn your phone into an advertising magnet based on your behavior, not on the phone. That's what's unique, right? Where you go, where you drive, where you stop, yeah. what you read. Yeah, I think where I find that, that these data companies are falling short, though, is that they're usually made up of engineers, and if you're lucky, a data scientist and a business professional, but they're, they're missing the actual subject matter expert, you know, the actual scientist. Um, I don't know, is DJ here? DJ didn't make it. So I'm, I'm working with a company that is developing technology that helps a clinical psychologist, this is my one minute pitch, helps a <laughs> clinical psychologist track their patient's well-being in between therapy visits. You know, when you see a therapist for depression, anxiety, marital conflict, whatever, you might see a therapist for, you'll see them for one hour a week or one hour every two weeks, but there's literally hundreds of undocumented and unaccounted for hours. Mm -hmm. And this technology uses passive and active sensors on the phone to give a sense to the clinical psychologist about what's been going on with you. You know, memory is inherently fallible. You sit down with your psychologist. You can't remember how you felt four days ago. Is there a conversation out there? Because there's Twitter and email if you want to ask questions. <laughs> Anyway, um, so the, the idea being that, uh, so when we started this, when, when they were starting this, we were saying, well, it's not enough that we have engineers that can do this. We need psychologists. We need research and clinical psychologists. It seems uh, crazy to build a company without that subject matter expertise. What do you think about that? Well, I would agree. I think that, um, you know, the, the same idea, that the idea that companies are building devices that doctors can monitor patients, not in the hospital or in the doctor's office, but walking around the house. Right? Like a Fitbit, your blood pressure, your temperature, your stress level, all sorts of things will be continuously broadcast back. Only the, there, there's got to be a doctor on that staff to tell them yeah. what's useful, right? I think that's 
probably a big piece that's missing. But you know, the most successful, I mean, this is, goes back 20, 30 years, but the most successful malpractice attorney in California um, was a dual MD, right, who decided to become a lawyer and oh, sue all wow. the doctors. So um, that's always been true. I don't think there's no mystery in that. So Janelle Robins Robertson wants to know, what role does mentorship have right now at Curvature? I mean, how do you cultivate it? How do you develop it? Um, I think you, you formally cultivate it by having you know, very direct relationships with, I mean, you have teams that we're, we're very explicit in who works with whom, and, and especially my team has their key contributors, and I'm often you know, meeting with them, skipping a level, and meeting with them and coming back. Um, but it's remarkable when you, when you can't hire all the skills you need, because you can't in Santa Barbara. If you, if you get large enough, you have to develop your own. And that's, you, a, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. that's a question Anna Pazer asked, exactly that. She wants to know what are the biggest obstacles and opportunities you've experienced about having a business in Santa Barbara? Uh, the, it's the same. The, the obstacle is it's the only place in the universe that has a higher cost of living, maybe even than San Francisco. So it's hard. I mean, LA, people move here and go, oh my god, I, I can't buy a house. And, um, the, the good news is if they, if they will move or if they are here already, which is obviously the best, they'll never leave. So it's a, it's a catch-22. If you can get them, you often, you know, there's, it's not a big community, although it's getting bigger from a business standpoint. Um, you have a great deal of loyalty, people to the community who don't want to leave. And with a relatively limited number of opportunities, you don't see quite the job hopping in the, that you do in a San Francisco or LA or New York. So we, we love being in Santa Barbara, but it has presented some challenges. I mean, we got, we've, we've had to be opportunistic in senior hires and, and sort of wait, as opposed to just line up five people with a headhunter. If those five people are from Dallas, Phoenix, LA, San Francisco, you got no chance. Yeah. I mean, you got none. And something you said earlier to me was that you find one of the mistakes young people make today is, is, is job hopping, mm -hmm. jumping around. What are some of the things they're missing out on? Well, I think that, and again, I think if you're, if you're working for a tiny company and you have sort of one job, then the, the most important thing early in your career is to get exposure to a variety of things. I think that too many people think they know what they're going to do and what they want to be, and I, I can't imagine they ever do, especially in this day and age. I certainly... Was gonna, I was going to go to either law school or philosophy grad school and went to trading and then within the bank ended up two or three different roles and then ended up out here. But had I not, you know, had I not had a game theory background, had I not been in trading, I never would have been as successful here. Um, and I spent, you know, 10 years at one place and now 15 at another. And you can learn a great deal. Um, within a company, though, you should lobby for different opportunities. And I think too often people... Um, you know, I think most people hop a job for an extra two bucks an hour, and that's a really stupid reason to hop a job. I think you could, if you're a programmer and you want to learn a new language, that's a great reason if you're going to another great firm. But if you're um, doing the same job at another company for a little bit more, you're often much better served approaching the company um, and saying, I'm, I'm ambitious, I want to do more, I want more opportunity. And at least at that point, you'll find out your value, because if you're valuable, um, you'll get everything you want, probably, and more. And if you're not, you'll find out, and that's important to know. I think too many people end up, you know, sort of swimming in the dark. Yeah, I mean, knowing yourself, that's a, mm -hmm. a great benefit of having a good mentor. They're well, gonna and ask the you. question, if they say, you know what, you know, John, you're, you're, we're not going to give you a $5 raise, you're, you're only so-so. Well, why, why am I so-so, right? It's not always, very few companies have such a disciplined human resource procedure that you know every day all the time how you're doing and why and what you need to do to do better. And we try very hard to do that, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard. And, and that's, I encourage people a lot. If they want more responsibility or they think they're underutilized, just raise your hand. Um, and more often than not, I mean, again, my, my assistant in 2007 went from being my assistant to managing facilities to opening new offices to working in operations, to running operations, to becoming the COO. And that was only because at every turn, she just said, I'll do it, like, you know, put me in, right? And every time she succeeded, she kept getting more opportunity. But 
Um, I don't know that when she was my executive assistant, I would have ever thought to have her, you know, work in facilities. It just wasn't. Yeah. So part of it's got to come from you as well. So looking at talent and, and acquiring great talent, I, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any techniques or secrets about hiring people. And I asked this question years ago when I had the chance to interview Paul Orfila, mm -hmm. founder of Kinko's, and he says, it's really simple, I take the person I'm considering hiring to lunch or dinner, and I just watch how they treat the service staff. Um, anything that you do that's Well, there's something to that. I think that if you're, depending on the position, um, that wouldn't work very well in computer programming. Right? As a, as a, that's a knock on as a, yeah. as a recruiting strategy, I think you, you'd end up with a really lame uh, group of programmers. But, um, but in, yeah, in general, well, are you saying that you can't be a, a, a brilliant engineer no, just, and be I'm, polite? I'm just playing the odds. Okay. <laughs> I'm just playing. That's the actually notes. funny because, uh, yeah, no, that's interesting. So you're looking for someone who is kind of awkward. You know, there's, there's, <laughs> I mean, awkward. I mean, there are some jobs that are, you know, and it's, it's all good news, actually. There are some jobs that really, really fit the person that would rather be alone in front of a television playing video games all day. Yeah. There are great jobs for those people, great jobs, because they can be alone in front of a computer doing something really technical all day mm -hmm. by themselves. And if you try to take someone who's really nice to the waiter and put them in a room by themselves in front of a computer all day, they're going to last about two months. Right. right? So I think, you have to, I think you have to know what you're hiring for. Um, in, a general, in a general human resource customer facing um, role, I think there's probably not much better than that. Take them to lunch, talk to them, get to know, see who they are and what they've done with their life, ask them open-ended questions about what they like to do, um, how they treat the wait staff is probably not such a bad thing. As I said, there's no secret to hiring. It's, it's really hard. It's hard. Well, this one just came in, and, and it's a good segue because you, you recently completed a pretty significant acquisition at Curvature. Mm -hmm. And Barry Fay wants to know how aggressive are you in looking to grow through acquisitions? What are you looking for, and do you have people focused on it? Um, we're pretty intent on it. We're being pretty aggressive looking at targets and we do have a staff focused on it. We, so our business is hardware maintenance and professional services now about 70, 20, 10, more, more or less in percentage terms. Uh, that maintenance division, we just bought a, a $20 million company in New York, but the maintenance world, is, we do networking. The company we bought does servers. We're looking at storage. We're looking at mobile devices. It's very hard to, to get an expertise in a decade worth of devices starting from scratch. And that's what we've learned is um, Cisco has 28,000 products in their price list that have come out over the last 10 years, 28,000 different products. And in order to maintain Cisco equipment, you have to have at least some reasonable familiarity with all 28,000, say 26 of the 28. Well, there's hundreds and thousands, if hundreds or thousands of mobile devices. So if we were going to, forget iPhones, but the medical tablets and industrial mobile devices, there's thousands of them. And if we were to sort of say, oh yeah, sure, we'll get into that, we'd get run over. Yeah. So, and yet there are small businesses in all of these fields, so we're looking to grow maintenance. Um, in the professional managed services arena, there are thousands of firms, and the hardest part there is almost every managed services company we look at is actually a hardware company with a, with a 2% managed service line. So we want, we want, and that's us. We're, you know, 10% managed service, 90% hardware. We want a company that's 100% managed service. But we are looking aggressively. And um, the private equity firm we work with, and one member of my staff is almost full time on that. Okay, great. Well, we're going to open up the questions from the audience here in a moment. But one more last opportunity to, uh, to give a pitch. Come on up. Excellent. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Pavier. I asked that question earlier. Um, I my business is celebrating 10 years. We're not a startup, and I'm in the technology business. I'm in the real estate business. I'm in the finance business. I own Santa Barbara gift baskets, and I'm super proud of all of the other entrepreneurs that I represent in this community. Um, with all of their local products. 
and um, I've enjoyed a lot of opportunity this past Christmas serving clients of some of your competitors, and I would love an opportunity to be an expert. Um, but we offer sales tools, which is a way to um, reach your clients and show off the community that you live in and support the community you live in. I don't think that's a minute. Thank you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Good advertisement. Good. What are some one-liners that you can share with the group that some of your mentors hmm. left you with that you still um, remember and you still live by to this day? Yeah. Oh, I, can, I can start with mine if you want. Okay. okay. So one of mine was whenever I was in the car with this guy, George Petty's, he was I was about 21, 22, and he was in his 70s, and we would go to a client meeting. He would always look over to me and say, what do we want to accomplish in this meeting? Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was the entire conversation. What is the intention of this meeting? What do we want to get out of this meeting? Mm -hmm. serves, serves me well, I still do it today. Yeah, um, yeah there, were, there were a few. Uh, early on, um, Bronya, the, the woman, the bridge player, told me that everything, at least, and in trading this is maybe obvious, but I think it's true in business in general, that everything you do is a risk and your job is just to take the best the best ones, right, and avoid the bad ones. And I think too often people are so scared of, of losing that they never take the risk in the first place. And I think that was a, a very good lesson to learn in trading where the good news is the feedback is immediate, right? I mean, you um, had a feeling the ECB was going to not, you know, come out today with such a strong package, so you went along the euro and you got destroyed in minutes. It was great. Immediate feedback. You were wrong. <laughs> Um, I was wrong. Was it oh. your money or somebody else's money? Oh, it was the bank's money, but your money in trading. I mean, it's you indirectly. It wasn't your own personal money. But um, so that was a great lesson in just uh, in, in figuring out that if you never take risks, you never get the reward. But you're going to be wrong, and being wrong is okay. So everything you do is a risk is a good one. Um, um, the the next one I think, which came later, was what does success look like? I think that was a great question. Before you start something, um, I say this a lot in executive meetings, so we're starting a project, whether it's anything we're buying a company, even to writing a little piece of code, what does success look like at the end? And then sort of work backwards. And mm. I think too often you just sort of charge in, and this is like, um, this is oftentimes like building a house. You sort of charge in and then the change orders start and three years later you finish. <laughs> and it really wasn't what you thought and it was twice as expensive as it was supposed to be. And, so at least in business, at least, we, we try to say if we're building a, a new uh, software screen that our sales admin are going to use, at the, how, do, how is it supposed to look? What, how are they going to use it? And then you work backwards from there, and it helps. And then the one I mentioned earlier from my father, it's all about the people. Right? It's, really, it's really, really true that you could, you could stack up a list of, of things to do and tick them off one at a time and six months later come up for air and the list is now 10 times as long, right? Whereas if you get used to, it won't be done exactly the way you do it, it won't be done exactly the right way maybe, um, but if you farm those out to 10 or 20 or 30 different people, you really will get them all done and, and then all you have to do is, is correct all the, the little things that you tweak. Um, but it is all about the people. You can't scale, I mean I guess that's not entirely true on the internet. You can have a small business with 10 people that's a billion dollars, but in general, you can't scale alone. You, you have to trust and, and, and give up some responsibility to, to grow. That's great advice. Uh, questions from the audience. We'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, Chris. This gentleman was first, then Jim. Hi, my name is Bruce Erickson. I want to say a statement about the importance of mentorship in a whole different light. I work on an international task force on the issue of sustainability and sustainability in communities and was a privilege to participate in town hall meetings and developments in several different countries. I can't tell you how many times when there's been young people in the room, and this is include Canada, the Netherlands, Sweden, okay, Japan, where they all said, you know, what we really need is mentors. We want access to people with the skills and expertise that we want to make a career of, we want to learn more, and what have you. And this is 
This has been time after time. By the way, I was part of the task force with Mayor Hal Conklin that led to the beautification of Santa Barbara 20 years ago. So uh, I speak from that experience, but it's what the students are, are asking for right now everywhere. Thanks, Bruce. There's a question right in the back, yeah. We'll come back. Mark? Well, thank you very much. Um, so my question kind of has to do with the, uh, something you touched on early on, which is you have to win about 35% of the time, and you're going to lose 45% of the time. And so the question is, you, uh, just listening to you, you make it sound like those losses are so easy that you just ah, I wrote it off and I just moved on. And you know, psychologically, it can be really tough to lose when you take a risk and you say, oh man, I got this one nailed, and this is gonna be big, and then you just get destroyed, like you said. Um, so what are your tips for people who, uh, when, they, when they go out on the limb, they take a risk, they think they've got it dialed in, and there was, they just get blindsided or, or, or T-boned or something by something that they totally didn't see, how do you move beyond that? Uh, that, there's a really good book in there that I think would make me a lot of money if I knew the answer. Um, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. I think it's, it's probably not dissimilar to what I tell a lot of people is that when you, when you take a risk and lose, I guess what you have to focus on is what did you really lose? Because if you lost money or you lost a little bit of time or you lost uh, a little bit of face or what have you, you didn't lose very much. And if the opportunity was, was great enough to take the risk in the first place, it's certainly worth taking it again. I think it's a little bit like surfing. You can crash and burn, but all you need is a couple good ones and everything works <laughs> out, right? So a lot of it, so I think, I guess the answer there is perspective, right? What are you, what are you risking? If you're risking your life or you're risking your family, I mean, it, you, you know, you're taking a pretty serious risk, but if you're risking money or you're risking six months of your life for what you think is a great idea, um, you're the only one that's going to put rake you over the coals for that, not anybody else. So if you keep perspective, I mean, even in investment banking, it's remarkable how many traders that ultimately became you know uber wealthy and super famous flamed out at three or four jobs at other companies before finally striking it rich. Um, it, it sometimes it's just perseverance and perspective. That would be. Um, thank you for everything and it's a great program. Um, my question is that um, you were speaking earlier, hiring people that do not know what you why why is oh sorry. Why wouldn't you hire people that would know more than you in different aspects or different areas of your business? Oh maybe I, I maybe I wasn't clear. I I would absolutely try to hire people that know more than me in all sorts of fields. All I was saying is that it's very uncommon for an entrepreneur to admit that any of them are smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and that's a difference. Nice distinction. Um, no, I think, it's, I think it's incredibly important to surround yourself with the smartest and the brightest and the most knowledgeable people you can. And it's often um, a real limiting factor of someone. If they won't surround themselves with people who might be better than them, they're, they're never going to be as successful as they could be. It's often that talent, I will tell you, that distinguishes the really good executive from the really good individual contributor. There are very few managers of any skill that are the best at that skill. And the best salesmen are terrible sales managers. So, I mean, it, 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 works, it works both ways. I think if you're willing to um, surround yourself with the best, manage, cajole, um, assist, you might end up being the most successful when you're not nearly as good at some of them at the actual task. So maybe I misspoke. Thank you. Um, my 22-year-old fresh start self, it would have been, um, yeah, probably short the euro. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, um, I'm trying to have, remember what happened when I was 22. Um, yeah, uh, go, go long monetary union. Um, 
No, I think it, I think I got lucky. I think that I would have told myself to to latch on to some really smart people that you can learn from and and try not to let go until you learned what you could from them. I think that's and the, and mentorship is an interesting concept because not everyone not everyone that you work for will be a mentor. Uh, most of the people you work for uh, not only may not be mentors, but they're the furthest thing from mentors. So when I'm when I tell people when I advocate, you know, find a job that you love, find someone that you can that can mentor you and stick with them. I'm not advocating just sort of stay in the office like the TV show and be loyal. I'm saying if you find, if you truly find that someone that inspires you and knows what they're doing, um, it's not worth a little more money to leave that situation. That's what you should try to find. Um, and those aren't everywhere, but when you find one, don't let go. That's what I would say. And I got lucky because I found one. I got a question. Okay, we have uh, time for one more question. Oh, no, no, no. We, well, I, I was curious because I, I had the pleasure of meeting your wife, and I don't know how many hours you work on a weekly basis, but how do you balance running a $300 million company that's growing, that's acquiring entities, and having a full family life, you know, and with children? How many kids do you have? Four. Four kids. He makes dinner every night, too. And he makes dinner every night. So what is the balancing, what's the secret to balance? Um, uh, yeah. um, the secret to balance is having a, a very understanding wife, first of all, uh, or significant other. But um, no, it's, it's understanding what you really need to get done and what other people can do. I think that's more than anything. I, when you're an individual contributor and you're paid for the work you do, which many, I mean, I was and many people are as they're rising in their career. You know, if you're a lawyer, you know, bill for 3,000 hours, more power to you if you can pull it off. But it, there comes a point in time when billing the, other, billing the next hour isn't what's going to move the ball forward. And I think for me, um, I often have to work early or work late, but, but there's enough people around me and I have a good enough staff that I can you know, be organized and the, one of the best pieces of advice I got, uh, this is an old, this is a story. And it's, it's, I don't think it's a true story, but it's a great, great story anyway. There was a, there was a guy that was, that was a consultant meeting with the head of a large uh, insurance company, I think was the story, the way I heard it told. And he said, you know, my, my company's kind of in a rut and my staff is, we're not getting anything done. I need your help. And he said, all right, I'm going to tell you uh, one piece of advice and, and six months from now you're going to send me a quarter million dollar check. And the guy, and the guy said, uh, uh, and he said, but, but it's up to you. If it doesn't work, no problem. And all the guy said supposedly was, if you just write down the three absolute most important things that have to be done the next day and do those things first every single day, you'll be two or three times as productive as you are today. And of course, the story is a month later, he got a quarter million dollar check. And, and, yeah. um, but I think that's absolutely right. I think that too often, and I say this a lot to my staff, too often you spend... 80% of your time working on the stuff that doesn't matter, and you only spend 20% of the time working on the stuff that really matters and moves the ball forward. Because there, there are so many things that interrupt you and pull your attention and, and, and feel like they have to be done right then because they're small little tactical things, right? And then there are the most important things that might be a program or a project or something that's three, six months, a year, two years in the making. And it, you know, it's like that thesis you had to write in college. You never have to do it today. Right? You never have to write your thesis today because there's 10 other things, parties you got to go to, homework you got to do, whatever. Um, I do think if you can keep your eye on the prize and figure out, um, and this acquisition was a little bit like that. We really wanted to make one. We went out and visited five companies and in two months found the right company and bought them. And, and it would have been so easy to just not do that and we never would have made it and the business would be very different. So focus and, and attention to what really is important. And especially in a startup, you know, do you need to spend another you know, 300 hours on some little thing or do you need to go raise some money or do you need to go you know, place the product in a store? What do, you, what's, what do you have to do to be successful and get rid of the rest? Well, Mentorship Works, thanks you for being here. We are recruiting board members. We'd love to have you participate and get involved, help us develop the organization and this incredible ecosystem we have in Santa Barbara. All the proceeds of tonight's event go to the Transition House. For those of you that don't know, it's an amazing organization that helps people that are 
kind of struggling, let's put it that way. And uh, thank you for, for your contribution to that. And please join me in thanking Mr. Mike Sheldon, CEO of Curvature. Thank you.